Dr. Justin Feldman uh, is a social epidemiologist and researcher and research fellow with the Harvard FXB Center for Health and Human Rights. His research focuses on the effect of social inequality on public health. Uh, he has published recent articles in the New England Journal of Medicine, American Journal of Public Health, and JAMA, uh, J-A-M-A. J -A -M -A. He has also been a source for the New York Times, covering deaths in police custody, as well as the COVID-19 pandemic. So wanted to make sure people knew you kind of know what you're talking about. I wanted to start because I've been hearing, uh, and I'm not somebody who like wants to unnecessarily, uh, you know, dramatize things. Uh, by all accounts, uh, the Omicron variant is quote unquote milder, milder uh, in terms of death. Uh, that could be for a lot of reasons, which we'll get into, I'm sure. Uh, partly because, you know, more people are vaccinated and partly because from what I've read, uh, it doesn't go as deep into the lungs as previous variants. Uh, so that's good news. We should start with that, that uh, it is obviously good news that less people are dying. Can you kind of touch on why less people are dying uh, from the Omicron variant compared to Delta and the original? Yeah, yeah. So, so it's this is a little complicated because I think something that's going to be a theme here is thinking about risks to individuals and risks to populations or societies or countries. So like the, they're, they're not necessarily the same thing. If I would, if someone forced me to choose between getting infected with Delta and getting infected with Omicron, I would definitely pick Omicron um, because all the evidence shows that it's, yeah, it's less likely to land you in the hospital. It's less likely to kill you. Um, however, so many people are getting infected in case you haven't noticed. Um, some parts of the country worse than others, that it's really overwhelming hospitals, causing businesses to close, canceling flights. Um, people are being pushed to, to go to work while infectious potentially. Um, and hospitalization rates are going way up. I've been following the data in New York City and there's been a 500% increase in hospitalizations in New York City over the last month. Um, we're at the highest level of hospitalization since May 2020. Um, and you know, New York City is big. It has, it's a destination uh, place for, for medical treatment. So it's not uh, overloaded yet, um, but a lot of other parts of the country right now, many states, they are. They're having to ration care. Um, so even though Getting sick on an individual level is less bad. Um, it's it's causing a lot of a lot of harm. I, I want to touch on the hospitalization part because I I've been hearing quite a lot about um, hospitalizations aren't as bad. Uh, you hear that a lot in the media. I've heard that a lot from like you know this guy Scott Doctor Scott Got Gottlieb that you know fortunately hospitalizations aren't as bad. I don't know. Everything I'm seeing, unless people are inventing charts, is hospitalizations are really, really bad. Uh, not just the charts I'm seeing, but just like looking on Reddit and hearing from nurses talking about, uh, oh, they're you know, patients are lined up in the waiting rooms on gurneys. Uh, we're having to shut down multiple floors. Colin, if you could show uh, the first tweet, uh, this is from Dr. Eric Feigl Ding. Um, there is no universe where you could argue that a huge 50% spike in COVID hospitalizations nationwide in just five days in a country of 330 million people can be ignored. And with holiday reporting delays, it will only get worse. Brace yourselves, protect your families. And I mean, the chart he's showing clearly shows a, a pretty damn big increase. So can you kind of touch on what is, what is fact versus fiction? Because you're hearing... Uh, I'm hearing on CNN and other places that uh, hospitalizations, there, there's a delinking between cases and hospitalizations, but New York City, elsewhere, we're seeing in the UK, which is one of us, in terms of the Omicron uh, surge, uh, massive increases. So why, why is the media saying hospitalizations aren't as bad, but charts are saying otherwise? Yeah, this, this has been infuriating. The last two days in the New York Times, there have been articles claiming cases are going up, but there's been no significant rise in hospitalization. Actually, 
cyberbullied on Twitter, some of these New York Times reporters, and they changed the name. They, they changed one word in their article, I think, because of me. They changed it from not significantly increasing to not proportionately increasing, whatever, whatever that means. Um, so yeah, case, it's true that cases are increasing much faster than hospitalizations. The rise in cases has been extreme in many cases, almost a vertical line. Um, the hospitalization rise has been significant too, quite considerable. Uh, and as I said, again, in many, in many parts of the country, overloading healthcare systems and continuing to rise. Um, I am, I'm looking in New York City, fewer, uh, a, a, a smaller percentage of people hospitalized need to go to the ICU, which is good. They're not being ventilated uh, as much. They're not needing to have more, more intensive treatment. So we are almost certainly going to see a rise in deaths. That's already started a bit. Some of these are lagging indicators. So first come the cases, then come in the hospitalizations, then come deaths. That's how, how the course of disease progresses. But I think we're seeing in the mainstream media and this, this dominant narrative of everything is fine, get back to work. Uh, and I would say everything is not fine. And we need, we need more, uh, you know, government support to make sure a ton of people don't end up dead or in the hospital. And really, like, healthcare workers are, are not having a, a good time right now, to, to put it very mildly. Could you kind of touch on the, the pediatric part? Because that's just, you know, all the naysayers are saying, oh, it's not fear mongering. It's nothing. Well, I don't think it's nothing that all these children are, are in the hospital right now. Yeah, we fr from the beginning of the pandemic, there's been all sorts of attempts to to minimize how harmful this has been. Again, this is, this is a pandemic that's killed more than 800,000 Americans, millions globally. But an attempt to minimize it by focusing on these kind of relative comparisons, like, oh, 99% of people survive. If 1% of people in the U.S. die, that is 3.2 million deaths. So. That's pretty bad. And similarly, we've been seeing people say, children are at much less risk than adults or especially older adults of, of death. That's completely true. But we've had over 800, 800 children die in the pandemic so far. I think about half of them have died just in September. Um, so there's really been an acceleration of, of child deaths, not to mention all these other concerns. In terms of long COVID, what, what I'll say there is like the research on it isn't really good yet. There's going to be years and decades of research into long COVID. So a lot of the long COVID symptoms are not exclusive to COVID. So it's hard to differentiate them uh, between, you know, some someone who's experiencing these symptoms for other reasons versus attributing them to, to COVID. But certainly um, we are seeing some evidence that's concerning, and I don't think we want to conduct this experiment where we allow everyone to get infected and just um, just assume that everyone's going to be okay. If even just a small percent of people, children or, or adults, ends up with long-term symptoms, uh, if you extrapolate a population of 320 million, that's a lot of people who are having long-term symptoms. 